What's up guys, Mike here from The Art of Guitar. Finally gonna do a Richie Blackmore artist series. It's one of my most requested artists, um, among a couple others that I'll be filming soon, so I'm excited about this one. I realized after going back and revisiting all of Richie's uh, licks and techniques that a lot of my style comes from his playing, so I can tell I was heavily influenced by him, even if it was sort of subconscious, because uh, grow up, growing up hearing Rainbow and Deep Purple, I remember my parents had the couple rainbow records and I was always intrigued by the covers so I would play them and then uh, style just rubs off you never know where your influences come from sometimes so uh, let's get right into it this is going to be a bit shorter than the other artist series I have new cameras that can only film about a half hour at a time so I'm going to try to get this done tonight but uh, just to let you know I could have done hundreds of his techniques but I boiled it down to uh, a handful for you okay here we go Highway Star has so many great techniques in it. I could do a whole series just on that song, probably. But a couple things I really love from it are one thing I call the arpeggio bends. Usually when you do arpeggios, you stop on a note or you just sweep right back. That's what a lot of people do when they do arpeggios or sweep arpeggios. But there's a really cool thing that he does where he does two notes into a third note right into a bend. So it's more like this. It's a cool way to ramp yourself into a bend. You know, sometimes you do rakes, you know, there's other ways of going into a bend, but to actually arpeggiate into it's pretty cool. And then backwards as well. Okay, piggybacking off of that, one thing that I didn't notice before, but I did when I was really doing some studying, was that his bends are often slower than what a lot of people do. Let's say if you hear somebody covering a song or a solo from Richie, a lot of people would do something like... But if you really listen and study his bends, especially in slow motion like I've been doing, a lot of his bends are scooped in a little bit slower. And it's funny that just doing that gives it just a little bit of feel that you normally wouldn't get. So here's a little bit slower. Versus. So it's one of those really subtle details that I love. You know, the deeper you go into somebody's technique, the more you find those very little gems or those little gems that really help you uh, distinguish your style from other people. So sometimes it's cool just to take a little bit more time to get to the note you're trying to get to with a bend. Uh, just slow down a little bit and see what happens. I've always wanted to learn the solo to Highway Star, but uh, when it got to the part where he starts picking really fast, I always assumed I could just tremolo pick and then just let my hand kind of do the trick uh, as far as all the work and uh, and it'll work out but what I realized is that I slowed it down and there's a real calculated amount of picking going on so you can't always just go crazy and uh, hope it sounds good in this case with the fast tremolo picking but timed you get this effect slow and that's kind of hard to do as you speed up here's what usually happens it just gets really messy. So I found out a way to really practice this, which helped me out quite a bit. And that's to add a lot of uh, emphasis on the first note. So we're gonna accent, in this case, the fifth fret A. We're gonna play it pretty hard and then fill in the rest of it. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna get you in this cool rhythm and it's gonna give you a little bit of a, uh, sort of like a navigation point to strive for every single time it comes around. Now it's gonna fly by, but as long as you have a little bit of a destination point, you can catch on. Okay, so if you go like this. See how it could keep the amount of pickings correct? And uh, it actually followed a beat. If you wanna practice this with a metronome, that'd be huge, okay? So just go click, 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 click. Every time you hear a click, really pound that first note. Just play it a little bit harder. That's how you get your brain to lock onto it. Then we move up. Just a little bit slower now. And if you want to put it into context. And I wouldn't be able to keep that steady if I didn't accent that first note. Now the good news is later you can relax and the accent goes away, but the uh, steadiness stays. It's kind of a cool little trick that I like to do. A lot of great guitar players do this trick. Uh, I shouldn't call it tricks technique. Um, either way, it's where you play a scale backwards of whatever you choose uh, to fit the situation, but you use open strings. It's kind of the uh, wasted years effect, I'll call it, or the thunderstruck effect, kind of. But what we're going to do here is we're going to double pick, and this is where it can get a little bit hairy once again if you're not really good at accenting. So here's what it's going to be slow. <laughs> Slow. 
So if you're not doing it real precisely, it can easily sound like this. I hear a lot of people play it like that. So once again, slow it down, get those accents in the right spot. Double picking can be tough at first, okay? So let's slow it down and add accents. And the good news is you're gonna accent every time your finger comes down to play one of the fretted notes, okay? Never on the open string in this case. So you get this. I'm just gonna use my index finger for now. Now, the temptation is to lift off too fast. I almost did it there. Try to keep it down for the right amount and then lift off at the right time. Eventually, you speed up the metronome and you get a lot better feel and a lot better sound. Uh, another thing, too, is using one finger is cool to practice with, but to make it a little bit more realistic, I'm going to use my ring finger for the higher notes, and then I'm just going to hand it off to my first finger. So I'm going to go like this. Might not seem like that big of a deal just using the ring finger for one for the first note, but it can really save you when you're playing live sometimes. Okay, so here we go. I love when a guitar player can take a simple idea, like three notes, and do a circular pattern with it in a in a cool rhythmic way, which could also turn into a cool riff, but in this case he's using it in the solo. So here's the idea of it. <laughs> That would make a great riff if you played it lower, maybe. Sounds kind of cool. A little hair metal or something. But to be able to play that in a solo situation can really make your solo a little bit more stable. Sometimes people are playing a lot of notes and there's not a lot to take with you afterwards. But if you do something like this that kind of flirts with the rhythm side of things, sometimes you're, you can give your solo what I call traction. So this is a really good exercise and a fun thing to practice. You just... <laughs> And then you can have the fun job of figuring out how to pick that correctly for yourself. I'm still kind of figuring it out. I like doing downstrokes in this case. And adding artificial harmonics, which can sometimes uh, make or break a lick. A little bit of Ace Freely coming through here. We got the staccato bends. Now, before I get to just a bend and doing a bunch of staccato, one really cool thing to add some feel to your bends is to just kill them right as they get to the very apex of that bend. So here's what I'm talking about. If you go like this. It's an old blues trick. It sounds kind of cool. It's You get a big bend and all of a sudden, gone. But it adds a little bit of a rhythmic feel if you do it correctly. So I dig that sound. Now if you want to expand on that, once you kill it, go ahead and do some real staccato picking uh, afterwards and you can bring it back to life but in short little spurts. So you'll notice in his playing that a lot of the times he's doing upstrokes. If you watch a lot of live videos of Richie, you'll notice that... Watch my picking hand real quick. You'll see that a lot with his right hand. He loves doing upstrokes, and that's a big part of his sound. So whether it's riffs, hear how that upstroke kind of gives it a different sound. Uh, if I did that with downstrokes, like for example, the staccato picking, it would sound different, even if it's just a slight bit of difference. Uh, I'm gonna try it with downstrokes once. Upstroke. Can't explain it. It just there's a pick sound that happens with it when I do it, and when he does it, and it's just kind of a different thing. So experiment. Upstrokes, downstrokes can make a big difference. Some people will roll their eyes and say no, but uh, give it give it a try yourself and see. This is uh, something I believe I subconsciously picked up from, from Richie, and that was the wet tremolo bar, which is funny because a tremolo bar actually does vibrato, so it gets a little mixed up. Nobody calls it a vibrato bar, as far as I know, but uh, he doesn't use it very subtly. Some guys like Jeff Beck, they're masters at playing and just using it as like a nice vibrato. So for example, Gilmore is another example of that. Uh, if you listen to Richie Blackmore, he'll get to the end of a lick and just go crazy with his whammy bar. My whammy bar is still messed up. I hate to admit this. All you guys gave me great advice about getting the spring put in. But yesterday at my gig, I went to use it and all of a sudden I felt it clunk. And I think the threads got messed up. So it's my fault. I ruined my whammy bar. But I'm going to see if I can get the last little bit out of it today. Look at how loose it is. That's just sad. It's funny. Watch Bob Ross peek over to uh, shame me even more. 
Okay, so anyways, uh, he'll, instead of going like this, for example, you'll see him go. It's just a really wide wave when he does it. So it's just a really good, cool way live to let out some aggression to really get a lot of sound out of your playing. And uh, it's just wild sounding. Okay, it's time to retire this poor whammy bar. Duh. Another cool way to get some feel out of your bends is when you do ghost pre-bends. And this is interesting because you're going to take whatever note that you're going for and you're going to pre-bend it, but just a half step. So you're going to go, for example, is that nice? So instead of going, you're bending it a little bit, measure a half step. Remember, that's just one fret difference. That's how we teach it on the website. We do the old compare and contrast method. Bring it up, pick, drop it down. This has uh, been done by all the greats and it's a good way to get out of your pentatonic box. We all like to stay there, of course. Uh, let's say we're in B minor pentatonic. Remember on the website, we teach all the scales and all the details about this stuff. And if you're playing in minor pentatonic and you're really used to the box shape, it's really easy to stay in there. It's hard to break out of it. A good way to get started in that is to add the second interval. Uh, let's go ahead and just play the minor pentatonic here. So if you were to play the diatonic, the full minor scale, instead of playing just B and going right up to the D, we would add the C sharp right here. So we're not necessarily going to add it here in this case. What I want to do is I want to jump up here to this D and then move it back half a step and we get to that, okay? When we get to that point. So Slash does this a lot too. Now that same note, C sharp, can be found up here as well. Three different places in this form. Now from here, if you want to add it, it's really easy, because watch. Little Santana going on there. You'll hear this later when we start to do some of the, uh, you know, his essential licks. He loves to bring that second interval in there a lot. And it opens it up a little bit. Like I said, it's a gateway to bigger and better things in the future when you want to break out of that pentatonic box shape. This next idea took forever for me to get the feel down until I realized that it's just one thing you got to think about. And all of a sudden, boom, revelation. It, it totally clicks. First of all, I'm going to do it up here because a lot of you guys are used to pentatonic licks. Now, in certain songs, there's a, a certain feel that's a little bit different than you're used to. So sometimes you get this sort of feel going on. That bouncy dun, 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 get swinging a little bit. Well, an easy thing to do in a swing feel is to do triplets. So you go like this one and a two and a three and a four and a. That's the kind of triplets we're talking about. So it's going to be the high note, the low note, and the middle note. That's we're going to do that in triplet feel. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this little backwards uh, pattern. By the way, over that blues feel, da do do da do do, it rides really well. Now, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add a quick pull off right off the bat. So, in this case, we're gonna go from the 15th fret to the 12th fret, D to B, pull off on the B string, like that. And then we're gonna continue on with the pattern we were doing earlier. Watch this. So, without the pull off, you just get with it. He does a, a really cool version of it way down low. He does this. I'll definitely be stealing that for something soon. Now, you know, out of all the videos, the unison bends keep coming back the most. It's our number one technique. I heard him use it in a really cool way. And usually if we're gonna do a unison bend, let's say at the first string, 14th fret, F sharp being our main note, usually you go to the string next to it and we go to the 17th fret and bend it up a whole step. So you get this. That's that weird tool sound. Sounds like it's rattling all funny. That's kind of the common way to do it. Sounds great. 
But what we're gonna do instead is we're actually gonna move up to the 18th fret. So instead of bending a whole step to get that unison sound, we're just gonna bend a half a step. I'm gonna go to my pinky now because it's a better reach. So try this one time. Little bit different, isn't it? Now what I'm doing is I'm making it into three note patterns by doing a, the first bend and then hitting the F sharp on the first finger twice. So I'm picking it sort of in a circular manner. But I'm not gonna teach that as a technique, the circular pattern, because I'm not sure if he does that or not. I've seen him pick it a few different ways. Uh, another thing you could do is you can go back to the bend on the third note instead of staying on this high note. So you can go like this. So here's the difference. First way, second way. And one thing he likes to do is as it progresses, he just gets crazier and crazier with it using vibrato and shaking it. And uh, it's just a way to really build the intensity. All right, you probably knew we were gonna have to do this. Uh, we're gonna be doing the inverted fifths, I like to call them, he calls them fourths. The reason I call them fifths is because when you listen to Smoke on the Water, for example, you get this. And I think of the main note as being this. So when we go underneath it and we do barring like this, this is a fifth below it here. So we get this. I'm going to call it inverted fifths, okay? Sorry, Richie, I know you call them fourths. Okay, so here's what we got. And that's a great alternative to a power chord, as we learned when I did the uh, seven levels of Smoke on the Water. Instead of going... Which is a common way to play a lot of rock tunes, instead of doing the fifths like this, we invert them and you get a whole different sound. You still hear that as Smoke on the Water, uh, but it's just a little bit, I guess, thinner, but more percussive in my opinion. Okay, so we get this. So he uses a couple tunes. So you probably noticed when I was doing that that I was plucking with my right hand. So instead of picking like we always want to do, I noticed in some live videos he was using his thumb and index finger. Gives you a nice pop. So I've seen him play it there, and I've seen him play it here. really hard to find out what he does most of the time because there's so many videos out there but uh try one of those two methods but the technique is just plucking with the fingers that's the most important part this is crazy usually when we do these minor pentatonic boxes we play them in the key of the song so g minor in this case here's g or the octave But if you are a member of our site, you probably have learned that I talk about the first four minor quite a bit. And if you go to G here on the fifth string, that's the 10th fret. There's a minor shape to the chord that's pretty unorthodox. Not a lot of people like this shape because it's really weird to play. But the minor pentatonic that goes along with it is great. Now realize I'm rushing through the theory here because it's more about the techniques today than the uh, you know the theory behind it. But watch as he superimposes the old traditional minor pentatonic over this uh, shape instead. It's kind of more interesting in my opinion. Does that sound great? So you get a little bit of a different sound. Of course, he takes it a whole nother place afterwards. But I was really surprised because when I first saw the lick written out, I'm like, oh, that's just minor pentatonic. Then I'm like, wait a minute, they're not playing in C. That's really weird. I realized that you could take this basic box shape that we all love from minor pentatonic and use it in more than one of the forms. If that's really confusing, it might be because you only know a few of the forms or you're not familiar with the cage system that I like to teach. But uh, go ahead and learn that. You can see it opens up a lot, new, lot more possibilities for you. Anytime there's a five note pattern, I'm intrigued because I think it's from Eric Johnson when he started going like a... That's a really fast five pattern. 
One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Anyways, I always thought five was an odd number. It's crazy to throw it over the top of a straight uh, type of beat. But he does a really good job of that when he does this pattern. And I'm not 100% sure if he plays it here, but this is what I was getting from it. So that's five notes. One, two, three, four, five. If you put that over even a, like a blue shuffle feel. It gives it that little scoop in the beginning, sort of like a horn player would do. So I'm going to start using that one. But uh, just five patterns in general is a really cool thing. He likes to use odd numbers a lot. Trills, of course, are very important for guitar players. And I've heard him do mostly whole step and step and a half trills. So the whole step trills would be... Takes a little bit of snap to get that going. And then speed wise, you just have to practice getting quicker. Okay, it's not about strength, it's about quickness. So uh, we do a lot of pull off and uh, hammer on techniques on the website to build up your hand speed. That would be a whole step. You're just hammering on and pulling off in a circle. Whenever you do step and a half, it's a little interesting because now you have to use your pinky or you have to stretch your ring finger. So a really cool way to do a step and a half bend is that way one is one way. <laughs> Tough folks, like I said, the pinky. So a fun way to change that is just to go to an open string and trill the third fret. You get a step and a half that way, and it sounds great. This might seem like kind of a roll your eyes technique, but when you use it live, it's a great way to lock into the rhythm section. So space truck and there's some. if you remember the seven levels of smells like teen spirit you get that kind of muted sound he just goes crazy richie blackmore when he's playing this in that song he's just going it's a great way to really lock in like i said to the band and it's not that far off from voodoo child for example in the beginning so you can use your guitar as a percussive instrument let's take d major one time and if you're familiar with all the triads in that key, you would get this. Okay, like I said before, if you're not familiar with any of this stuff, we do teach all that on the site. But uh, for today, I'm just gonna show you how you can utilize that by doing some kind of pattern with it that could sound really great in a solo. So if you just take that concept and move it around between all those triads and pick it a certain way, it sounds great. Then you could feel free to move that around anywhere you want to. You can go backwards if you want. So adding that to a solo can really give it sort of an interesting classical type sound, especially if you harmonize it with another guitar. Okay, I'll call these weeping bends. And um, we did this a little bit in the Prince video. But what we're going to do is we're going to pre-bend a note and we're going to play it. This time we're going to go a whole step instead of a half step like earlier. And our goal here is just to get a real weeping sound. So you're going to pick the note and bring it down so it's weeping. So you can see if I bring it up and down, it doesn't have the same quality. Sounds great, but there's something about that pre-bend that makes it sound weepy. So you probably recognize that from the song called Stone Cold, one of my favorite rainbow songs. And uh, he also does what I call staccato picking. In this case, in the solo, it's used very effectively. And uh, I wanted to show you how important and how much this can affect your sound. So staccato picking, whenever I pick, it's easy just to let it ring out and go like this, for example. But staccato picking is where you kill the string right after you pick it. It's kind of easy to do it if you go upstroke and then do a quick downstroke and rest the pick on the string. So it's like, that's one way to do it. And then the opposite, if you do downstroke, mute it with an upstroke, just touching it as you come back up. So you want to practice that, you could just go. And then just try it with a couple of notes like. If you ever notice when he does uh, any type of slide, he's really good at just kind of producing the slide out of nowhere. It's like a magic trick. But 
he is not putting a slide on his finger, if you notice. You know, this is what I do. I put it on my pinky. Then you get a nice slide sound like that. And I also like to use my ring, uh, my other fingers to help mute behind the slide. We go into slide guitar quite a bit in other lessons. But if you watch Richie Blackmore do it, he just holds it. It's really strange. It's like his hand looks like he's just doing this. But if you really look, if you pause the video like I was doing, he's holding the slide in a way that you could see maybe a, a lap steel player, you know, those steel players that play like this, what they would do. And it's really interesting just to hold the, the slide like this, place it on the strings, your thumb can still come up in the back like this. But for me, this is very foreign. So at first I couldn't get any sound. It sounded like this for a while. And it was really rattly and stuff. It's hard not to push on it when you're holding it like this for some reason. So what you gotta do is you gotta have a real light touch, be able to just kind of balance the, the slide like that, and then experiment by moving around, just some simple notes. Just go like. And then start to give it a little vibrato because all slide players do that. What I like about holding it like this, I don't think I'll ever switch to this, but uh, there's a different kind of feel when you do vibrato. You can move it up and down in a weird way and or circular, uh, so it does open up some new doors. But I just wanted to show you that he's an excellent slide player, uh, if you ever watch some of the live stuff. But what you will notice uh, is just the odd way that he's holding the slide. And then, of course, to get rid of it, he just throws it really fast or something, or holds it in his mouth, I saw in one video. So You guys have to get to know some exotic scales, I'll call this, because uh, in a lot of songs, there's that real kind of Egyptian, Middle Eastern, strange stuff going on. Uh, it, what happens is if you learn the Phrygian dominant mode, you'll end up with this. <laughs> I'll start you off quick with this mode. What you want to do is you want to start here at the E, which will be the fifth string, seventh fret. And instead of doing your normal Phrygian, if you know your modes, it would be this. Instead of doing that, we're going to still do the half step in the beginning. But then I want you to skip an extra fret. So it's going to be strange reaching your pinky up to the 11th fret. I know this is a very untheoretical way to teach Phrygian dominant, but this is just so you get the idea. Yeah, that's the cool Egyptian sound. It's that Iron Maiden thing. All right, from there we go to the next string and we're going to go 7th fret, 9th fret, 10th fret. Next string, 7th fret, 9th fret. Then you're at the octave. Start there because if you want to do the next octave, it's pretty weird. You have to go. So this feeling is really weird at first, so I'd recommend starting off with the first octave and just practicing right there. Great to write riffs with, you know, and to solo over the top of it's fun. Go ahead and just start with maybe an E pedal tone. And then from there. See how cool that is? It's a little bit of Metallica wherever I may roam. That kind of a sound. This is huge for guitar players who want to get some more depth in their notes. Instead of just going into a note, for example, like this. Just as an example, try raking into the first note. I rake twice in that one. It's wherever you really want to just feel like you're digging in. So don't be afraid to rake. It's all about muting. Now you can rate rake with just your right hand, your I'm sorry, your picking hand. And so what I do is I rest my palm on the strings and I just go like that. And right before I get to the note that I'm actually targeting, I let go. For example. Now yes, you could do like a sweep arpeggio and actually rake on notes. But what I hear from Richie Blackmore a lot is just a lot of dead notes, de uh, dead strings into a note. Which I also hear from guys like Satriani. That's how I first learned it. 
that kind of stuff. Just a cool way to give a little percussive sound before your note and like once again gives it traction. And there's a few things he does live that are wild and crazy. You know, he smashes his guitar, he takes his, his cable and plays the strings. Uh, but a few of them I wanted to focus on would be the cello effect that I like that he does. And Eddie Van Halen does this, a lot of great guitar players do this. That's where you turn your volume down, you hammer on a note and you swell it up. The important part is that you hammer on before you start turning up, otherwise you hear the attack. You don't want that. You want the attack to be invisible and then turn up the volume. Really great players can pick and use their pinky if you're using a Strat type guitar, like that. Ingve Malmsteen's really good at that. Uh, sometimes I just like to hammer and twist like this. A little more obvious, but. That effect has really come through for me a lot with uh, different projects. Like if there's a string part in the background that nobody can cover, I'll just do it on guitar and it's usually pretty cool. All right, a lot of you guys know this trick. There's a hammer on pull off harmonic slide, but this is just a picking one. And just choose a string, most likely, or uh, the best ones to choose would be the fat strings. And then just take your finger and touch the string and just go up and down and it'll create all these cool harmonics. You get this kind of effect. <laughs> slide it could just be a cool thing to throw in live it's a lot of fun and it, uh, it sounds great and so for the final technique we have to go to the other room where the amp is and I have to show you how to do controlled feedback and that's where you're gonna hold a note and you're gonna make it do a bunch of cool things just by the angle of the guitar let's go check it out okay guys so here's the amp I used for this uh, video and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna play a note I'm gonna turn up and I'm gonna face the speaker and the feedback is gonna start hopefully it's gonna sound decent but it's going to be fighting the pickups creating sort of a crazy magnetic field. I'm just talking bro science here, I have no idea. But watch how as you turn the guitar in a diff couple different angles, you get a couple different sounds. Here we go.